Hello and good night, everyone. I welcome you uh, and thank you for your presence tonight on this talk on the impact of sanctions on Iran and Iranians abroad on the diaspora. Um, this topic of US uh, sanctions on Iran could sound heavy for a cold Monday autumn night, but it's not every day that we have the chance of the presence of one of the best American experts on contemporary Iran. Um, uh, Professor uh, Eric uh, Huglund. Um, he went to Iran in early 70s as a Peace Corps volunteer and later wrote uh, uh, his PhD uh, on land reforms on Iran and never stopped um, studying this country, uh, publishing on Iran uh, with the intention to of a better understanding of this country. Um, I'm going to read you a part of his impressive uh, biography that uh, may seem long to you, but I uh, assure you, believe me, that it's maybe a fifth of what he has uh, accomplished. So actually, uh, Eric Hoogland is uh, right now an editor of the scholarly journal Middle East Critic, and this is since 1995, Professor Emeritus of the Center of Middle Eastern Studies, Lund University. A presenter for the Gold Leaf Institute of the University of Maine, Farmington, and an international academic expert of contemporary Iran uh, from 1900s to the present, a country about which he has not been has not stopped searching, teaching, and writing for 50 years. His most recent publication, *The Wages of Neutrality: The Fate of Iran During World War One*. Another one is a navigating contemporary Iran and also gender in contemporary Iran reflects his broad interdisciplinary research interests and complement his previous publications, which are five books over and over 100 articles, which examine diverse aspects of Iranian culture, government, history, international relations, literature, political economy, sociology, sociology, and religion. Prior to Lund University, Professor Hoogland taught Middle East politics at Bates and Boding College in Maine, Ohio State University, the University of California, and Berkeley, St. Anthony's College of Oxford University, Shiraz University in Iran, and Middle East Technical University of Oxford um, in Turkey. He also has worked in Middle East issue with several non-governmental organizations, including Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the National Security Archives, the Middle East Institute, and the Institute for Palestine Studies. In his main Humanities Council sponsored presentation, Iran and the United States, Prospects of Rapprochement, Professor Hoogland reviews the complicated history of US-Iran US relations since the end of World War II. Because of the prominent role that the United States assumed in the 2014-15 negotiation that resulted in the United Nations Security Council agreement and the subsequent withdrawal of the US in 2018 from the, uh, the Trump, uh, under the Trump administration, coupled with reimposition of even tougher US sanctions on Iran, he will assess the prospects of the Biden administration's pursuing de escalation between the two countries. So, without further ado, I will invite Professor Hoogland to talk to us about the impacts of sanctions on Iran and Iranian diaspora. Professor. We don't have a voice. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Arazu. Uh, I want to begin by saying that uh, the sanctions on Iran have been in effect now for over 40 years, which is longer probably than half of the audience has been alive. So they are very long running sanctions in the only other country in the world which has had sanctions as long or in this case longer than Iran is Cuba. So uh, these have been long sanctions. 
Now, often when people talk about sanctions, they think of the sanctions that were placed on the Iranian nuclear uh, plans uh, to uh, prevent Iran from uh, enriching uranium to the level that it that one needs to make a nuclear bomb. Uh, and they and the assumption is that these sanctions are related to that and that uh, they were ended when the uh, uh, joint plan of joint plan of action agreement was signed between Iran, the United States uh, uh, and the other uh, four members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany representing the European Union. Uh, th those were specific sanctions related to that uh, to that agreement, uh, and uh, and those sanctions uh, related to Iran's nuclear facilities were suspended uh, between 2015 and 2018 when Donald Trump uh, withdrew the United States from that agreement and reimposed the sanctions. However, they were a whole variety of other sanctions which were not related to the nuclear ones and they remained in force. They were never lifted. And I think it's important to understand that and we need to look at them. Now, the first sanctions on Iran were imposed in November 1979 by the an executive order of President, then President Jimmy Carter. And they were imposed in retaliation for the Iranian government sent, uh, approving of the takeover of the United States Embassy by a group of uh, students from the University of Tehran and capturing the US diplomats who were there in the embassy uh, and holding them for hostages. And this led to what was known as a hostage crisis. So they, those uh, sanctions uh, for, uh, did not come under the uh, 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 JPOC agreement. Uh, those sanctions were in force in, uh, for uh, almost two years. Uh, they uh, they was a negotiation. Uh, Algeria decided to intervene after in uh, the fall of 1980 after Iraq had invaded Iran and started the Iraq Iran war. Uh, uh, and through Algerian mediation at the end of uh, 1980, an agreement was reached whereby Iran, whereby Iran would release the US, all of 52 of the US hostages at the time. Uh, and uh, and uh, and US would uh, live, would, the US would not lift the sanctions immediately, but they would go into negotiations with Iran at a special tribunal, uh, uh, which was set up in The Hague in, in the Netherlands to negotiate that. So the hostages were released and the uh, tribunal was set up. Uh, all has happened uh, in, uh, in uh, 1981, and some of and many of the claims under that were resolved uh, with uh, with uh, the U.S. trying to do that, uh, given returning some of the things that were under sanctions. However, a new level of sanctions were imposed on Iran. Uh, beginning in 1984. These uh, were related to what the United States called Iran's support for armed factions. And literally that's what it says, armed factions. And what did that mean? Uh, now, uh, I did mention uh, that 
Iraq had invaded uh, Iran in 1980, so Iran was actually at war with Iraq at the time. But in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. And the, pro and, and, and the reason for invading Lebanon uh, was because they wanted to uh, drive the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, out of Lebanon, which was based in the Palestinian refugee camps. These are the people, uh, the, the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, were the people who had been, the when, when Palestine had been a province of the Ottoman Empire, and then it was taken over by Britain after the First World War, and Britain decided it was going to create a homeland for the Jews, even though Palestinian, Palestine was populated by two million Palestinians. So in 1948, uh, when Israel was ready, when Britain was ready to withdraw, they had let the Jewish immigrants declare a state and they went around and, and like Haifa and other places. The British army rounded up all the people, put them on boats and sent them off to, to Lebanon. So this begins, this begins the end of Palestine, the creation of Israel on part of Palestine and the Palestinian refugees. So you had a Many of these, uh, you know, several thousand of these refugees live in, in southern Lebanon and the Beirut, uh, and the PLO had been had been formed to liberate Palestine from Israel. So this is what the 1982 invasion was all about. Uh, it was a pretty brutal one, the bombing of of uh, Beirut. A lot of civilians were involved, uh, and. Uh, the Europeans were upset, and finally the UN intervened, and several countries decided they would send uh, forces to Lebanon to keep the peace and protect the PLO from Israel while it was to withdraw to Algeria and other places. And the US sent a force of soldiers over to Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, over to Lebanon and helped with the evacuation. And the US. Uh, forces stayed there uh, because they wanted Isra Israel to withdraw, and Israel gr gradually withdrew. Uh, while all this was going on, there was a civil war in uh, Lebanon uh, that bro had broken out in 1975, and it was still ongoing in 1982. And this had to do with the whole complexion of Lebanon. Lebanon, when it was set up as an independent country, by the French in, during World War II. Uh, uh, it was set up in such a way that, Israel, that Lebanon had 18 recognized religious communities. And everyone in Lebanon belonged to one of these 18 religious communities. Uh, five of them were Islamic, Sunni, uh, 12 Imam Shia, the Druze, which uh, what kind of Shia are the Druze? I think they're, uh, I, I, I forgot what that, I think they come from maybe the a dispute over who was the rightful eighth or ninth Imam, uh, and and uh, the 12 Imams, Shia had what we now know as 12 Imams, accepted the infant son, and the uh, ones who did not believe an infant could be an Imam, followed uh, like uh, the, the adult son of, a, of an uncle of that infant, and they end up being the, what we now know as a Druze. Uh, but I apologize, I don't remember which imam that was about. You also have the Alawi uh, uh, Shia, like you have in Syria, as you know, the Alawi R12 uh, imam, but they do not believe that the 12th Imam uh, went into gay bath. They believe he just died and went up to heaven and there was no Imam after him. Uh, so that, that and uh, that's the uh, uh, difference between the two, two 12 Imams. And then you have uh, the Druze, uh, the Allah. We have some Ismailis also in Lebanon. And I believe they're descended from the seventh Imam. I once knew all these, and I apologize, I don't remember them, but uh, yeah, but you might know them better than I do. So, so, uh, but but these these uh, these are the different uh, uh, Shia 
groups in Lebanon, and the Sunni and the 12 Imams Shia being the largest. Among the Christians, the Maronites are the largest sister group. This is a, I suppose you would call the Maronites a somewhat Sufi version of uh, Christianity. It, it arose in the third century in Lebanon. Uh, a, a, a monk called uh, a Maroon, uh, Maronite comes from that. They have their own liturgy, uh, and uh, while they were considered heret they were considered heretics, of course, by the Greek Orthodox Church. And so, when the Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church split, the Maronites sided with the Catholics because they were far away in Europe and weren't persecuted them the way the Greek Orthodox Church was. So they're the largest group. You have uh, Greek Orthodox, there's a lot of, that's probably the second largest Christian group. You have uh, Melkites, who are Greek Catholics, either Greek Orthodox, who didn't like the use, use of Greek in the uh, uh, in their service because they spoke Arabic and they wanted Arabic. Uh, uh, but since uh, they since they use the Greek service, but in Arabic instead of Greek, they're called uh, and they were being persecuted by the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. They decided to be recognized Rome like the Maronites on condition they could still use the Arabic services, which had done with the, in the Greek mass, which is kind of interesting. So you have them, the Greek Catholic, you have some Protestants who came, who were converted in the 19th century, several of those. You have uh, um, Armenians, you have uh, the Armenians, who live in, you have Catholic Armenians, Armenian Orthodox, and Armenian Protestant. So you have all these different Christian groups. Uh, and the uh, and, and then and then there's a total of 17 Christian and Muslims in the 18th are Jews, the Jews who lived in Lebanon. I think at this point there's only a handful of Jews left in Lebanon. Uh, and I really mean a handful, like 10 or less, uh, but that are recognized. So everything is recognized and you have to do everything in Lebanon based on that. The largest single group, uh, none of, no one has a majority, happens to it was for a while the Sunni and the and the Maronite, but by the 1970s, the 12 Imam Shia were. And where do they live? Southern Lebanon is a big thing. And so when the Israelis invade in 1972, what villages were being destroyed? The villages of the Shia, and they were all fleeing to Lebanon. And so you had this big antagonism towards uh, Israel growing up among the Shia. And there were several different political parties. Uh, uh, some people thought the Amal party wasn't radical enough against the Israeli invasion, and they formed a group called Hezbollah. So and Hezbollah was engaged in the Israeli military. And so what does Israel do? But they say it's, uh, it's a terrorist group. And so when we talk about Iran's support for armed factions, what does that really mean? It means that Iran is given support to groups like Hezbollah. It's given support to uh, uh, the Syrian Alawis. It's given support, who, who actually happen to be the government of Syria, by the way. Uh, and it's given support to the Houthis, who were once part of the government of uh, Yemen, but, uh, uh, but are now being opposed by a group which is supported by Saudi Arabia. So this is what this idea of sanctions on Iran for its support of armed faction. In other words, the these different uh, separate group of fa 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 sanctions beginning in 1984 and continue up to the day are being imposed on Iran for supporting groups which are opposed, if you will, to governments in the region that the U.S. supports. In the case of, of Yemen, of course, there's no government for it to support. So, but it's Saudi Arabia, which is in the UAE, which are intervening in Yemen. So the U.S. gets involved to support Saudi Arabia and Yemen in their war against the uh, the the uh, Houthis, who happen to be Shia, not 12 Imam Shia. They are. Uh, 
uh, what are they in Yemen? Seven Imam Shia. So are they? So? No, no, no. The Shias in Lebanon and Yemen had a living. Hey, they have a living Imam. They have a living Imam, but they're Shia. And so uh, they uh, these are types, and these are types. These are what they talk about now, uh, and that means if. The United States decides to invade Iraq, which it did. Remember, in nineteen in two thousand one, two thousand three, uh, and uh, and some Shia groups are opposed to that invasion. Actually, Sunni groups were too. Uh, uh, then Iran support for Shia groups is considered uh, the support for an armed faction. So there's been a whole level of these sanctions imposed on Iran because of what the US considers its support for armed faction. And that's the term they use, by the way, armed faction. Because if you call them armed factions, you don't have to recognize them as being any kind of legal group. Uh, uh, and then there was a and then there was another state, uh, uh, another set of factions, which came about, I would say, uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. And these were called sanctions on states, quote, not cooperating with uh, the U.S. war against terrorism. You know, the war that began in 2011. So Iran was considered a state not cooperating with the U.S. Uh, war against terrorism, uh, and so that, so some so there's a whole level of sanctions that have been leveled on Iran uh, uh, under that 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 particular executive order, uh, and uh, and then uh, and then there was another whole group of sanctions that again been put, placed on Iran, uh, and these are what the U.S. calls a foreign terrorist organization. So this is, uh, th these were uh, beginning uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, these groups, which the US considered a foreign terrorist organization. Now, what is the main foreign terrorist organization in Iran? It's the army, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, which is in fact the army of Iran. Uh, so they decided that, that was a, foreign terrorist organization, a, a designation. A designation is a state department term for what they have, they have designated a group of a foreign terrorist organization. So they have these sanctions on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. They have them on Hezbo Lebanese Hezbollah. And what is Hezbollah? Uh, Hezbollah. It's a political party in Lebanon, which has been part of Lebanese government since uh, since the peace the peace accord in 1990 between all the different religious groups. And in fact, uh, all the political parties in Lebanon represent some political group. So they single out Hezbollah for terrorism and, and not the uh, Lebanese forces, which is a Maronite group or the Sunni or any other. So uh, this is considered a uh, a, uh, a terrorist group and Iran is supporting that. Hamas, which is a group in uh, among the Palestinians, which uh, grew up around 1987 to protest the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank to Palestinian territory. Uh, uh, and so this is considered a terrorist organization. Uh, pa Palestine Islamic Jihad, which is a, uh, a, a much more religious group than uh, Hamas, and, uh, and that's mostly based in Gaza, but some in the uh, West Bank. And that is considered a uh, terrorist group. And Iran has done that. And there's a whole range of what they call, uh, in, in, again, State Department terminology, non-Islamic Palestinian terrorist group. And these are all the others, uh, which are not like, uh, the PLO was on there for a long time until the US had a agreement with the PLO in uh, what, 1992. Uh, but some other secular Palestinian groups are on there. So any of these, uh, and then of course the one in Yemen, uh, the Houthis and the official name of that group is uh, uh, 
what is it? Uh, is it Ansar Allah? Ansar, like the helpers of Allah. Ansar Allah, and I, can, I think it's Ansar Allah, it's, it's pronunciation somehow. So this becomes that because Saudi Arabia doesn't like it because Saudi Arabia doesn't like any Shias. Uh, 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 but it's uh, but but th this is this is the official name of the Houthi political group in Yemen, uh, which is fighting against Saudi Arabia and uh, UAE right now. It's been for years. So all of these uh, these uh, Iran is perceived is given. Uh, support to these foreign terrorist organizations and therefore there's a whole range of sanctions and there are other types of sanctions also but the important thing I want to make about these other sanctions because these are not sanctions which have nothing to do which have nothing to do with Iran's nuclear activity and so these sanctions stayed in place in Iran even after Iran made this nuclear agreement uh, uh, in 2015 with the United States and the United Nations Security Council members. So even though the U.S. lifted some sanctions uh, at that time, the, all the ones that were involved with uh, that were put on Iran because of its support for uh, 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 what they call foreign terrorist organizations remained in play. So those those always stayed there. Uh, but it is true that when the US did lift the sanctions uh, in 2015, it did uh, temporarily, you might say, liberate the Iranian economy uh, and made it possible for Iran, which had really had virtually negative growth, to have a somewhat of a growth spurt for two years in its economy. There was a relaxation within the country that you could do things uh, like uh, use a uh, bank and accounts again because the banks were all blocked before that. So they, there was a respite there where things looked uh, like positive in Iran for a while. Now, before all this happened, I would want to emphasize that the Iranian people, more so than the Iranian government, right, the Iranian people had to learn to live with these sanctions and they became very adroit at learning how to survive under all these what I call secondary sanctions, which had nothing to do with uh, with the nuclear thing and had to do with what U.S. foreign, what, what I might say, what U.S. foreign policy or Israel Actually, Israel was uh, was deciding who these groups were terrorists or not, and the U.S. was following Isra Israel pattern. Uh, but when uh, one of the things that uh, happened when Trump pulled the United States out of the JPOC was that uh, the sanctions, which had been in, uh, removed were reimposed on Iran, or the term was used snap back. They were snap back on Iran. Uh, but in this case, only the US did that. The other, the European countries did not, which kind of uh, did not please the United States. And uh, under the Trump administration, there was an executive order to punish any country which was providing uh, oil, buying Iranian oil or helping Iran in any way. Uh, and so that brought us into kind of a little bit of a problem with China and Russia and other countries and so forth uh, who were buying Iranian oil. Uh, so the US sanctions have, on Iran have been very difficult on Iran. Uh, 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 and especially uh, in 2000, uh, uh, 18 and 19, uh, and uh, and they've been a lot of problems for other countries uh, uh, because the U.S. Uh, is is going after them, uh, but uh, it has been very bad for Iran. Uh, while we thought, let's say, progressive people like me 
naively assume that as soon as Biden came in, he would go back into that treaty. That has not happened yet. And he has been in office now. It is uh, January for over nine months. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, I guess I am not optimistic that these sanctions are going to end soon. And even if even if they go back, the specific sanctions related to uh, the nuclear agreement would be the ones that would be uplifted again. They would be removed again. And all these other sanctions that I mentioned, the sanctions because Iran is perceived as supporting uh, foreign terrorist organizations would remain in place because there's never been any negotiations on on removing them. Uh, maybe I can stop here and take questions. I don't know if I talked longer than I said I would, but uh, if I did, I apologize. Actually, Actually um, I would like to ask you uh, questions. I think there's a echo, but um, um, there is a, a certain amount of myths that uh, are important to clarify for the general population because um, there's a rhetoric that uh, tends to um, banalize to sort of pretend that sanctions are not, they don't have really an effect on the economy and then the, the other narrative is everything is because of mismanagement inside the country, which is also, but it's uh, the proportion, they, they tend to minimize the proportion of sanctions. Um, to, uh, but we know that, you know, any other can, country that would have uh, had these amount of sanctions would have really have had hardship in any circumstances, even with the best management. So um, to sort of uh, uh, tell us a bit about this minimization of the impact, for example, um, they um, pretended that there was uh, in Rex uh, during the pandemic and, and also during the, the re, you know, harsh harshening of the sanctions since 2018. The, protagonists of sanctions, uh, especially our fellow Iranians, tell us, well, no, uh, medications are not under sanction and sanctions are, are, are OK. You know, they're a form of uh, political pressure. But we know that INREX, which is the exceptional um, instrument in Switzerland banking that is supposed to permit these transactions, has never, ever worked. We don't know of one. There was just one transaction in the whole process of it um that was uh, the the pilot project but it never worked because there's so many uh, sanctions so that's that's one thing that i wanted to say because it's really important sanctions kill there was a report by professor um Solihi Esfahani, uh, a year ago exactly that said 30,000 more lives had been lost because of sanctions and since then the 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 four the third and fourth wave of uh, COVID has hit Iran really badly. So we can think that there's tens and tens of thousands of lives that have been lost more because of sanctions because of different uh, elements of the sanctions. So this is for one part that I would like to you to tell us about the harshening of sanctions and also a bit on the um, levels, like there was a comparison. You said that the sanctions in Cuba were longer, but they were no, never that extensive. There's like, I read a report that said we had one thousand, like something around 1,000, over 1,200 elements of sanctions, but Cuba had only 80 of them. Like in every um, elements of life were basically sanctioned on Iran. So I would like you to really like tell us about the impacts of the reality of the harshness of sanctions. And then I have another question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the, the harshness of the sanctions, if you read the uh, discourse in the Congress when they were being debated, some of them were imposed by law and some of them by executive order. Uh, the idea behind that is to make them harsh so the people of Iran would rebel and overthrow their regime. And that is not just for Iran, that was a rationale for Cuba. 
uh, that was a rationale for uh, uh, the sanctions on North Korea. That's always been the rationale. Uh, but these sanctions, this is, doesn't make, uh, there's no place that I've ever seen any evidence where people have rebelled against their government for the sanctions imposed on their country by a foreign government. So I don't I don't even know where this ration comes from. I'm going to be quite frank and tell you where I think it comes from. It comes from especially people on the right in America who tend to be racist and look at the rest of the world through racist views. And most people don't want to say that, but I think it's important to say it right up front. It's racism. It's pure, unadulterated racism. And uh, to talk like that, to not care about civilians, to be, and, and Donald Trump exemplified that to the utmost with no care for civilians, either in America or any place else, probably, I would say, unless they supported him. Uh, uh, they were they 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 impacted the country, uh, and I think again uh, that 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 uh, report uh, or talk you referenced for Salahe Isfahani, where he showed that before Iran uh, and the settled down on the JPOC, the sanctions were hitting Iran very hard, especially in that period to. 212 to 215. They were very harsh in that period. And and yes, they uh, and the Iranians had to, the Iranian people had to find ways to adjust and adapt and be creative because because they were hurting. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, and uh, I don't know if they blamed it on the. I don't. I I, I have never. I'm sure there were some Iranians who would blame it on the government, uh, but uh, usually if they blame it on anyone, they'd blame it on the British, uh, which always surprised me. They always thought even US sanctions were a plot by Great Britain. Some of the older generation, I don't know about the younger generation, uh, uh, but, but they were hurting and even though they felt they might feel the government was could be better. Better, they felt that their government <laughs> wasn't doing. Their government wasn't doing it. It was a foreign government, and there was a a, a period of of uh, a relief and uh, briefly in two thousand. Uh, uh, 16 and 17, that the economy was doing better, people were feeling better, and then suddenly after two years, they come back worse than ever. And and they were combined with COVID. So it's been a very difficult, at least for my friends in Iran, and some of them I've known since, uh, you know, since the late 1960s and early 70s, uh, and know their children and grandchildren. Uh, for these, for most of the people, this has been a very difficult period. And I think most of them would say the, the last two years are, uh, it was even worse than the period before the JCOP. Uh, and that does, and you know, trying to find food, medicine, and all of that uh, does, does not endear them to uh, the people who are responsible, i.e. the U.S. government. Uh, but, you know, the Iranians will say, well, we might have a bad government, but the but, well, the American government it does, is not any better. So, you know, because they, they know where it's coming from. They know that the U.S. government. So even the Iran, and they are Iranians will say they don't like the, uh, their, I mean, I know some will say they don't like their own government, but, uh, but they think, but that doesn't make them, but they don't also like, but they also don't like what the U.S. is doing. So, mm -hmm. what can I say? Well, we seem to have more questions uh, coming in. Um, it says, what, one of them is, what is your view on negotiations regard, regarding GCPOA talks? And if USA will return back to the deal or not, do you think it will ease the sanctions against Iran if they reach an agreement? And can it be the beginning of the end of sanctions on Iran? Well, uh, it's been very slow. Uh, those of us who far, far, 
uh, fall of foreign policy, uh, have been very disappointed at how slow the administration has to re-engage with Iran. Uh, and I think that the Iranian uh, government is more, has been wanting to do that. Uh, but it's been very slow on the part of this, this new Secretary of State who doesn't seem to uh, know what to do or when to do it or how to do it. I've been very unimpressed with him. Uh, uh, he's certainly better than Mike Pompeo. I'll give him that credit, but uh, but he doesn't seem to be astute and caring the way John Kerry was. Uh, so these negotiations should have been uh, negotiate should have happened much earlier. And I know that uh, at least uh, if you read the German press, the Germans who are part of this JPOC and the French, those two governments have been very, they were also a part of it. Those two governments have been very disappointed. I don't know anything about the Russian or Chinese press, so I can't tell you uh, if what what they feel about it. Uh, they say that, I mean, they are somewhat talking, but I don't, but I don't know what they're doing uh, and nothing's happened. But if the US does go back into the agreement, they will not end all sanctions. They will only end the specific sanctions related to the, uh, the uh, nuclear program. Uh, and and, and one, one of the big things on that would of course be the SWIFT agreement where Iranian banks uh, can have access to foreign cu currency. That would be, that 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 is something that happened under the nuclear one. But a lot of these other ones that I talked about, the sanctions because of uh, uh, entities, and it's always going to be a problem that the U.S. considers the the primary army, and that's what the Revolutionary Guards are. They have the main army of Iran, whether one likes them or don't dislikes them. Uh, uh, they're, they're still going to be under sanctions. There's going to be those sanctions be, because of this. There, there are also individuals under sanction, like the foreign, the f former foreign minister is under sanctions uh, uh, as individuals, individuals who support terrorist organizations. That any minister in Iran, some of those. So the, there's still going to be a number of sanctions which is still in place, uh, which it, uh, don't make any sense except that he, the U.S. considers itself the main power of the world and it has a right to do it. This is where they all come from. And the U.S. just has to end all sanctions. Uh, and I think that the uh, my reading of some of the, uh, 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 the German and French press, not so much the American press, that the Iranians want a lot of these other sanctions listed is not just the ones particular pertain to the to their military, uh, uh, to their nuclear program. Uh, they've already uh, are willing to accede for that, but some of these other sanctions, which are on individuals like officials in the military and uh, the government, uh, that is problematic. For, that, that would be problematic for any country. I cannot imagine what my own country, the United States, would do if uh, Russia or China said, you know, we're going to put sanctions on you because we don't think your president is fit to serve. Uh, yeah, probably we would send a nuclear bomb over there. Uh, almost, uh, it's, uh, and yet, uh, yeah, the U.S., to be frank, behaves like an imperial bully. I'm sorry to say. But yeah, it would it would ease up, but uh, it's not going to end all sanctions because most of the sanctions are not are not part of the JPOC. Those only apply to the sanctions that were specific to the nuclear the nuclear concerns. Uh, Professor Hoogland, um there's a, another um, um, comment that says uh, that uh, wants you to elaborate on the impacts of sanctions on Iranian diaspora with the consideration that recent um, a recent study from uh, uh, Peterson Institute in Washington um, that was released recently says that Iran is um, you know on the many many countries that are sanctions from the United States 
but Iran is really on the top uh, on, in the extent of the sanctions on the different, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, elements of life. So, uh, for example, North Korea is in 440 cases of sanctions, but in Iran is 1,732. And North Korea is a nuclear power, and we are not, and we have like more than uh, four times more sanctions than North Korea. And so again, it's uh, this uh, treats of the question of the extreme harshness of these sanctions that costs life in Iran. And also we want you to elaborate on, well, what are the impacts of on the diaspora? Because some people say, well, we live in Canada, right? So what is, what is it for us? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, yes, uh, yes, the number of sanctions on Iran is unprecedented. Cuba doesn't have that many sanctions. Venezuela, or what else is sanctioned? Libya uh, never had that, that amount of sanctions. Uh, North Korea, uh, Iran, as I said, uh, one, of, one of the problems when we talk about the JPOC, it's important to get back into it, but the a number of sanctions which are, which are connected to that agreement and can be listed and uh, are only a fraction of the 1,400 plus that are on Iran. Many of them have to do with all of these other uh, 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 sources that I like the sanctions that deal with Iranian support for terrorist organizations, terrorists as defined by the U.S., Iranian support for uh, non-state actors who are disrupting governments, uh, and 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 that that, that that's just there's just there's uh, I think those sanctions uh, for Iranian support for non-state actors, there's probably 500 separate sanctions alone just under that. Uh, it's, it's really an incredible list. Uh, and how do they, well, yes, of course they affect the diaspora. I can't speak directly to Canada. I can speak directly to the United States, uh, where, uh, it's very difficult for uh, people uh, in the United States to, uh, to have their their family who live in Iran visit uh, uh, because uh, it's very almost difficult for them to get visas. There's no embassy in Iran where they can get visas. They have to go to a third country. They could be rejected and often they are, sometimes they are. Uh, 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 you can't mail anything to Iran. Uh, uh, you can't, there's no, you can't, you know, if you have uh, people who, who are hurting because of, uh, they can't, you know, medicine, whatever, that you can't send money. There's just so many things that can be done, even if, from, from a humanitarian point of view, under the sanctions. And even if this nuclear, uh, the, uh, and some of these sanctions, uh, which hurt families in the diaspora in terms of how, their ability to help family, those are not going to be lifted uh, if there's a new agreement because the JPOC doesn't, uh, uh, because the JCOP sanctions are mostly specifically to do with uh, Iran's nuclear power. There's, there's a whole set of new uh, sanctions on, on like countries sanctioned for helping Iran uh, drill for oil, repair its oil fields. None of those are covered. Uh, those are a whole separate range of sanctions which don't come under the JPOC sanctions and they remained in force uh, and, and will remain in force. So uh, the J, J, uh, the, J uh, the JPOC, sorry. Uh, yes, that that is a big help. Uh, but the all of the sanctions have to be attacked. And right now the focus is just on that. Maybe the easiest thing is go step by step. Uh, 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 you know, some of my friends, for example, one of my best friends in Iran I've known for over 50 years, he has a daughter uh, who, uh, who wants to go to college. You know, how do you even apply to go to college in the United States, even if you have relatives? How do you do that over there? There's so many difficult 
things. Uh, and, you know, and they keep in the U.S. keeps those sanctions on because some politicians in the Congress feel that eventually the people will rise up and overthrow the government. That same that same hope they had for Vietnam, which they never rose up against the government. In fact, the people were burning themselves in the street because they opposed the government. You can, it's like the years of foreign policy disaster that the U.S. has had, and I, Vietnam was a disaster. Iraq was a disaster. Uh, Afghanistan was it. We, the U.S. has not learned any lessons, any lessons at all from uh, these disasters. And yeah, the people, uh, the, uh, the Iranian diaspora in this country, uh, they're not victim lies, but they are victims because they have relatives of, uh, back in Iran and sometimes very close relatives and they can't help them. Sometimes they can't even see them. Yes. Um, what, uh, well, one of my um, relatives or something that I've heard often is, well, if you're for sanctions, you're not Iranian. Well, so this is something that people that, you know, are really um, aware of the, the I think, uh, who have lived or seen the consequences or felt the consequences really spontaneously say, can, how can you be Iranian and support sanctions? So th there's a risk. I would agree. How can you be Iranian and support sanctions? How can you be an American and support sanctions? And let me say as American, I am against sanctions on Iran and every other country in the world. And I think that is a, that is a stand that everyone should take. It's anti-human. Period. It's true. So, but I don't make some, policy. Some people in we, in our diaspora that have a, maybe they're very uh, they're not. We cannot exactly know the percentage, but I can easily say that they're you know overwhelming majority of people are against sanctions. But to justify the sanctions, they're going to say that the sanctions is applied only to the Revolutionary Guard, or what they say the IRCJ. But when you look at it, all the lobby, the you know the the some, you know we we know where the lobby anti Iran lobby comes in the Parliament of Canada. They all they never say that sanctions are good because sanctions, as we know, they're so unhuman that no one can say I'm human and I'm pro sanctions. So they sort of. Um, make it sound uh, um, acceptable by saying, oh, it's only uh, the government, so or it's only the IRCJ. But we know that as part of the government, if some, if you sanction a part of the government, of course, everything's going to go under that umbrella and it's going to be, you know, it's just an excuse because then again, how is somebody going to prove that there's no IRCG um, uh, in in any Iranian, any Iranian has to do with elements of the government that have to do with IRCG is implicated in the whole economy, in the military of the country. People do their um, mandatory um, service with with that uh, entity. So of course we know that then the, it's an excuse, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. So um, I wanted you to uh, talk to us, to talk to us about about it because I've heard some Iranians unfortunately say, well, you know, sanctions, you're free to like them at different levels. It's as if, you know, you like your steak medium cooked or, <laughs> you know, overcooked. So you can have medium sanctions. And so I wanted you to uh, comment about that. I will say this. As an American, I say the sanctions are wrong and inhumane. And I cannot appreciate anyone living in a country under sanctions or living or coming from a country not understanding that they're wrong and inhumane. I'm an American and I don't like the fact that my country behaves like a bully around the world. I oppose that very strongly. And, uh, and for those Iranians, if there's some in the diaspora who feel that way, then, uh, and, that, and, and you don't want to, and you want to support these 
evil policies, then my feeling is you should go back to Iran, period. And I've told Iranians that, including sometimes the parents of some of my closest friends, and I have no problems in speaking out. Now, if I was living in Iran, maybe I would have to be executed. Uh, and I'm sure there are people in this country who would like to do that to me, but uh, we don't do that in this country. But yeah, I think to be a human being, you have to oppose all forms of oppression and this economic oppression, which affects the lives of people, their health because they can't get metal. It's some of the most evil and one has to stand up against evil. That's what being a human being is all about, in my view. And I don't distinguish between American, British, Iranian, Chinese, or Japanese. But I live in a society where racism is rampant. I've always opposed that racism. Uh, uh, and uh, ever since I was a young kid, and I've seen some of the awful things. And, uh, and, uh, and people think uh, uh, it depends on, where you stand. I suppose if you're an African American, you're probably going to just hate sanctions because you feel you've been under sanctions for centuries in your own country. Uh, you know, I think if you really want to be a good human being, live in a democracy, democracies, real democracies, don't impose sanctions on their own people or peoples of other countries, period. If you have disagreements, you discuss them, you don't use force. Thank you so much. I wanted to say just as a personal, uh, because you said you, that sanctions in Canada are not uh, felt for you. You're, you're, you don't, you're not uh, exactly sure what they are. Well, we have, we impose the same sanctions uh, that the United States because it's an extraterritorial, illegal and extraterritorial law. Uh, uh, the sanctions of the US are applied secondarily to Canada. So the, the, all the companies that have a lot more business with United States don't want to take any risk and just sanction uh, Iran. And on for the diaspora, what we have seen is that sometimes these companies are very cautious and they don't, they, they, sometimes it has happened that they refuse to do business with any Iranian fearing that these are parts that could affect one way or the other and they don't have, they don't want to take any risk. So we've seen banks closing for no reason, uh, students accounts or people's accounts or people's business. Uh, some people do business, you know, between their two countries, they can't anymore. So it has influenced their um, personal economies. Uh, I, as a doctor, see regularly patients come to me because their family can't take this or that medication. When it's a, a little medication, we can do something, but uh, most of all, uh, Iran is lacking uh, um, material, like take, uh, some um, um, uh, 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 medical supplies, let's say, plus uh, medication that are for rare disease or complicated disease like cancer patients, and they can't find it, and they come to me, and I, and I can't have them because the companies refuse to sell them to me when I want to send them to Iran. So uh, in all those senses, plus, of course, the fact that we have closed the embassy, um, more so even that the states who has a bureau of general interest in the Pakistani uh, embassy in Washington, but the, uh, the Harper conservative government just plainly simply closed uh, with no reason the embassy since 2012. And I, for an example, could not go back to see my family because of that and bring my children. And people, well, that was for a trip, but people need to go see their sick parents or for their parents to come here, or, you know, they have trouble with uh, some legal um, uh, things for the, the citizenship of their children, or when they die, they need, they have things with the in, inheritances of their parents or themselves. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it complicates uh, very much uh, the situation. Yes, all good points. Uh, yeah, Canada, I would have to say, is in some ways sees it in its interest to accommodate the United States. 
The United States is, I mean, Canada, you know, its population is what? The same as one U.S. state, California. Maybe, maybe not quite as much as California, but close to California, which is the most populous state, which means that the United States is a, is a superpower right next door. Uh, and it cannot, the, the political leaders in Canada, whether they're conservative or whatever the other party is, liberal is it? I can't remember. Yes, liberals. Yeah. They, they are rational and see that it's not in their interest to antagonize the United States. And maybe many European countries feel the same way. Uh, I mean, collectively, they're not as strong as, as the United States. And, and that is why some of these countries have gone, have gone along with them, even though they're, they're very unpopular. Uh, if Canada could go its own way, it might not be willing to be as aggressive uh, against Iran or other countries or even China. You know, the whole thing, they had to arrest someone in China because the U.S. told them to uh, uh, for, for, for reasons which I think were bogus. Uh, 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 that woman who finally got let go. Uh, uh, but see, uh, China retaliated by arresting Canadians. China was not going to arrest Americans in retaliation, which they probably should have, because you know, uh, you know, Canada can't can't go against China, but the U.S. can, uh, and that is uh, that is uh, a problem of being. Uh, I mean, it's a large country and area, Canada, but a relatively small population. Uh, uh, and I would say in some ways Canada is more humane than the U.S. in its foreign policy and other things, but uh, they have to be careful of not treading on the toes of the giant next door. And Canada has had to, has had to manage that relationship all of its existence. Um, so I, I would be more harsh on the U.S. than Canada. I think if can I, I don't think Canada would have any of these these uh, policies, which are very irksome. I'm sure you you said you know they bother you. They they're they're painful in term painful in the sense that you can't help your own family back in Iran the way you want to do. But would Canada even do that if? They didn't have some kind of urgent from the U.S. urgent, which uh, the Canada knows would turn to pressure and worse if they did not cooperate. And that's you know that's that's you know, and that's one of the problems I have with uh, the government of my country is that it does act like a bully. There was a time when it didn't. Well, maybe there wasn't. I don't know. I, they could. There was a time when it was not strong enough to, not population enough or strong enough. But I would say since uh, the 1890s, yeah, yeah, that's that's a hundred and what hundred and forty years. Yeah, the U.S. has not been intimidated about acting like a bully in the world. But never saying that that's acting like a bully. Always presenting it in idealistic terms. We're doing it for democracy. We're doing it for freedom. We're doing it for this. We're doing it so the people of Iran will rise up and overthrow their government. So the people of Cuba will overthrow their government. Oh, I mean, I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's very very very. Uh, you know, minimizing the will of a, of a people than to impose sanctions to make them yes, do, yes, what we yes. should do to punish them. It's a it's a really um, very basic uh, violation of uh, the base the most basic human rights. And as we know, that sanctions often sort of open the space for for open war, which. Uh, 
um, United States has done, at least in my live life, uh, to many countries neighboring Iran, like uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, or Libya. Uh, when you, uh, I mean, uh, so we have to, as Iranians, I think we have to be cautious about all those rhetoric, uh, know well uh, why are they are said, what are the intentions behind some rhetoric, and not accept anything just because it seems nice, but really go behind it. And Professor, you have helped us uh, see behind uh, the uh, these um, these rhetoric of sanctions. Thank you very much for your stand for Iran uh, and for humanity in general. Thank you for all your work and with the extensive knowledge that you uh, you have, we need to invite you uh, very soon again. But I'm going to close tonight. You know, the U.S. is going to open the border in November, so we can go to Canada again. <laughs> <laughs> With pleasure to see you in person and and, and invite other peoples to uh, to be able to meet you. Uh, but we're going to close now so that our YouTube. Can I give one final thought. Pardon me. One sure. final thought. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the Mongols came uh, to Iran and like Tus and Ray, they completely. Uh, destroyed those cities, slaughtered every human being, man, woman, and child. Uh, uh, what is more humane about the U.S. is they do it slowly through sanctions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same kind of uh, brutal, inhumane attitude towards people. It's true. It's just yeah. done in a slower way instead of uh, that more shocking way the Mongols did it. But if they hadn't destroyed Tus, you wouldn't have Meshed. If they hadn't destroyed Ray, you wouldn't have Tehran. If they hadn't destroyed that village in Russia, uh, that they, I forgot the name, but Moscow, like Tehran and like Meshed, were founded by the survivors of those other important cities. Yes, but maybe we would have had the Industrial Revolution in uh, Tus. Who knows? <laughs> 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 yeah. So. Thank you so much, you so uh, much Professor yeah. Hoglund, and uh, wish to talk to you soon in Montreal in person. Yes, yeah, I haven't been there for a couple of years because of COVID. <laughs> Be well, long live. Thank you so much. Koda Hafez. Koda Hafez. <laughs>